All right, looking forward to what God has for us today. Been anticipating all week uh, what the Lord would speak uh, to us through his word and by his Holy Spirit. This is the portion of our service that we set aside every Sunday to look at Bible prophecy. Uh, we believe that we are living in what the Bible describes as the last days, and we typically, usually, primarily focus our attention on the nation of Israel. Uh, we see Israel as God's prophetic clock. For the last two weeks, we've devoted our time to examining the Bible prophecies concerning Egypt because of the situation there in Egypt, which, by the way, uh, m even though it's not occupying all of the time on our uh, television news channels, uh, it is still going on uh, and actually, I believe, getting worse. Now, we looked at Isaiah 19, uh, we looked at Daniel 11, and we also last Sunday looked at Psalm 83, all of which are prophecies that involve either directly or indirectly Egypt as a player in the last day's prophetic program, especially as it relates to these nations attacking Israel. Now, that's what we're going to do today for today's update is sort of round a corner and see how that what's happening in the Middle East, uh, Egypt uh, primarily, is all about Islam destroying Israel. I hope you understand that. When I say that, what is behind that, all of that which you see uh, happening there in the Middle East is that it is Islam. And the goal of Islam, which by the way, Islam means submission, is to force by submission the entire world to worship Allah and his prophet Muhammad. So that is what's really going on over there. And that's why you'll hear on occasion the discussion as it relates to the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, which we'll talk about more uh, momentarily. The fact of the matter is that the destruction of Israel as God's chosen people is the satanic end game, if you will, as it relates to the end of the world or the end of the age. You have to understand that in the spiritual realm, there is a satanic agenda, and it's nothing new under the sun. It has been from the beginning of time. Because you see, the Messiah would come from God's chosen people, the Jewish people, the Hebrew race, and both Christ's first and second coming are predicated upon the nation Israel, the Jewish people being here on earth, which is why the likes of one Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and all of them with him would desire, satanically so, to destroy Israel. See, if Satan could have destroyed the Jewish people prior to the first coming, theoretically he could have thwarted the first coming. Now he failed, obviously. Now he's trying to thwart the second coming. I don't know if you realize this or not, but at the second coming, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, uh, after the rapture, rapture, tribulation, second coming, in that order, the Jewish people will call for their Messiah to come. See, I think that we do err when we uh, think that maybe Satan doesn't know the Bible as good as us. I don't mean to rain on your parade, but he knows the Bible infinitely better than you. And he knows this about the Jewish people and the second coming of Christ. So if he can wipe Israel off the earth, then he can, again, theoretically, thwart the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
That's what's really going on in the spiritual realm because, see, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers of dark, darkness, wickedness in high places. Never think for a minute that our battle is against Muslims. It's not even chiefly against Islam. It is a battle in the spiritual realm. And our weaponry is not carnal in nature. We are given spiritual weaponry, the most important of which is the tool of prayer, the weapon of prayer. That's how you put on the entire armor of God that we have listed there in Ephesians chapter 6. I want to make it very clear before we go on here that the reality is this is a spiritual war and it is going on behind the scenes and what we're seeing in the Middle East, Middle East is the satanic end game, the, the satanic end of the world as far as Satan's agenda. And that's the why behind the what that we're seeing there in the Middle East. Now, let me hasten to say, especially to those who would label us gloom and doom, sign-wearing preachers of fire and brimstone, the end is near. They're right. Well, actually, sort of. Uh, my sign wouldn't say the end is near. It would say the end is here. I believe that the Lord's return for his bride, his church, is at the door. And there is nothing prophetically, biblically, that has yet to happen before that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. And at that time, of course, we get our new bodies, something that I look forward to with great excitement and anticipation. I'm a firm believer that God does not want us to be ignorant about what's going to happen in the last days. I believe that the scriptures are very explicit in that we need to be watching, we need to be ready so that his return for us, his bride, will not be for us as a thief in the night. And the scriptures are replete with such prophecies all with that intent of getting us ready and having us so that we're watching. In Matthew 24, 44, Jesus said, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. In other words, when the Lord comes, it will be at a time that we're not expecting him to come. I think it's interesting that some have uh, su suggested that Jesus is coming on, what is it, May 21st? Have you seen this? Isn't that interesting? I'm just wondering. I, I would just love to have an intelligent conversation with these people if that's possible. I don't mean to be rude. It's a gift. But I would like to ask them the intelligent question with the anticipation of an intelligent answer. If... The Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour of his coming, not even the Son of Man, only the Father, then pray tell. <laughs> what makes you so special? That you would be given the day and maybe even the hour of his return. Listen, I, I know this might be a, a firm grasp of the obvious, but... When the Bible says it, that settles it. Now, we have the word of truth we call the word of God. And if the word of God says this, and someone says that, guess who's wrong? I know I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer, but uh, I think God's right, and they're wrong. All right, I just needed to get that off my chest. I feel so much better now. Thank you. See, I want to be among those who are ready so that the rapture of the church isn't as a thief in the night coming 
at an hour I do not expect. In Luke's Gospel 21, 28, a verse I know many of you are very familiar with, uh, Jesus said, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. See, the common denominator in all of these, be ready, be watching. You don't know the hour. It'll be as a thief in the night. It'll come at a time or an hour you do not expect. Uh, and when you see these things begin to take place, here's the common denominator, look up, stand up, because your redemption is drawing near. See, the Lord wants us to be watching for his return. Now, I want to go to an updated graphic I created using Google Earth uh, because I love PowerPoint. And uh, <laughs> I want us to get a visual of what could very well be Bible prophecy fulfilled in real time. Uh, let me say it this way. Uh, it seems to me that the reality on the ground is that what we have in God's word telling us what's going to happen is right now in real time happening. Now the yellow arrows are the countries or people groups that are listed in Psalm 83. Again, we looked at Psalm 83 and that prophecy in great detail last Sunday. In fact, we devoted the whole teaching to that prophecy in Psalm 83. And to a people group, to a country, uh, we see right now in the Middle East that they are all sort of set in motion and they're all coming together. And interesting, these governments and these rulers are falling one by one sort of with that dominoes effect. Now I added to it some white arrows, at least in part, not in full, but these are the nations that are listed in Ezekiel chapter 38. And again, the common denominator is they're all focused on, they're all targeting, they're target on the nation of Israel. And by the way, I, for those of you who are uh, really good with geography, uh, have you ever stopped to look and notice how small the, the nation of Israel is? And how big these whole, in fact, I had to, you know, get a, a wider shot from Google Earth and I could barely fit it on the slide. As you can see, it's kind of crowded there because Israel is just this little tiny, itsy bitsy little sliver. And then to, to the left of, of, of Israel is Egypt. And then you have Jordan. And then you have Iran. And then you have Russia. Wait. And they all seem to be intoxicated with Israel, and particularly Jerusalem. <laughs> you know, that this alone authenticates and validates to me that God's word is true. Isn't it interesting that God's chosen people are the ones that are persecuted? That Israel, the land that God gave the chosen people, is the target and the focus of the entire world? Here's a question. What was Jesus referring to when he said to stand up and look up because our redemption is near when they begin to happen? Arguably, it would have to be the very things that we see beginning to come to pass in the Middle East today with the focus of the entire world on this little tiny nation called Israel. Uh, you know, the Middle East is on fire. I have been studying Bible prophecy for many years. I have been teaching Bible prophecy for many years, and I have never seen anything like this. And it's getting worse. In fact, as you're probably aware, Sometimes I'll take a news headline and then I'll correspond it to the 
Bible prophecy and sort of connect the dots and put the prophecy puzzle pieces together to see how that what we see taking place is beginning to come to pass as the scriptures say well I tried to do that this week and I failed miserably uh, I could not even get my mind around all of the headlines listen if I would have done that and you know one by one one headline and sometimes we'll do four or five six you know on a on a Sunday and if I would have done that this week with all that's happening in the Middle East we would have been here for about seven or eight hours and I know you don't mind we have a break for lunch great potluck good grinds well, I think I, I actually lost count. We might have about 40 headlines here. So I'm just going to go through them very quickly. Perhaps you'll indulge me. These headlines that I'm going to read for you began just from last Sunday, the last time that we were here. So I'm going to start with Sunday while we were here last, last week, the 13th. Here's some headlines. Turkey's goal in first visit to Iran says to boost ties, Ezekiel 38. Jordan, Muslim Brotherhood, Israel, U.S., losers in Mubarak ouster. Egypt, reportedly losing control of Sinai to Bedouin violence. Palestinians, more barriers to be removed. Algeria shuts down internet and Facebook as protest mounts. Mubarak's departure thwarted Israeli strike on Iran. Ruling Egypt after Mubarak, presidential contenders emerge. Iranian opposition defies warning, calls for ally. Mubarak's fall shows need for Mideast jolt. <laughs> you think? <laughs> That's already happening. Jordanian foreign minister denies regime is in danger of Egypt-like fall. Egypt has lost its status in area while Turkey and Iran are on the way up. That was just Sunday. Here's Monday. <laughs> yeah, I told you. Israeli prime minister, Arab world undergoing earthquake. IAEA head affirms Iran steadily enriching uranium. Israeli army ready for all eventualities, Prime Minister. Hamas chief, China, India to replace failing U.S. as superpowers. Injustice in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is mentioned in, uh, as is Libya, Ezekiel 38. Pro-reform Saudi activists launch political party. Gaddafi tells Palestinians revolt against Israel. Egyptian opposition figure rethink Camp David Accords. In other words, the peace agreement that Egypt, the first Arab country in the Middle East to do so, signed when then President Anwar Sadat, which is, by the way, why he was assassinated. And by the way, did you know that the Muslim Brotherhood assassinated him? And the Muslim Brotherhood assassinated Anwar Sadat because he signed a peace agreement with Israel. Uh, that, and that's what led to his assassination. Uh, Hamas leader in Gaza calls on Egypt to open blockade. Fayyad dissolves Palestinian Authority cabinet. IMRA analyst U.S. omits peace with Israel. I don't know if you realize this or not, but we've already basically removed any remaining support uh, of the nation Israel. Everything that we're doing right now is either already on the table and it's just lip service at best. Here's Tuesday, February 15th. Yemenis trying to oust leader protest for fifth day. Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood to set up party once restrictions are lifted. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Iran confirms one killed, dozen injured in protests. Maximum security at four Israeli embassies due to threats. Iran blames Israel, U.S., for supporting protests. Western intel, 
post-Mubarak Egypt is ripe for Islamic takeover. <clears throat> Egypt presidential hopeful peace treaty with Israel is over. Here's Wednesday, February 16th, Nasrallah. Hezbollah will conquer the Galilee. EU's Ashton targets Palestinian state by September. This is basically echoing what the President of the United States said, September of this year, two states. September of this year, two states. Uh, what do you got going in September? Just asking. The new Middle East at a, yeah, I'll give you a minute to think about that one. The new Middle East at a glance, <laughs> country by country. Iranian nuclear facility recovered quickly from Stuxnet. By the way, that was that virus, uh, computer virus. Jordan government shakeup creates tension with Israel. Israel ready for end of peace with Egypt. Protests in Libya, Bahrain, and Yemen as unrest sweeps Arab world. Here's Thursday, February 17th. Libya protests. Activists call for day of anger. Four killed in Libya clashes. Opposition NGO. Hezbollah threatens Israelis anytime, anywhere. In sharp reversal... U.S. agrees to rebuke Israel in Security Council. I don't know if you have been watching the news, but I find it very interesting that even though we stood alone in vetoing a U.N. Security Council declaration citing the settlements in Israel as illegal, we're calling them illegitimate. I was watching an American broadcast on Al Jazeera, and I just about couldn't believe my eyes. I almost fell off the chair. And things like this don't usually shock me. But I sat there watching the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, describing what this really means and what this doesn't mean. And then they had the spokesperson, the one that was there at the UN Security Council, and she was talking about how that all the administrations have deemed these settlements illegitimate. Listen, I'm an Arab. I, ho I hope you knew that. Visitors are going, you are? <laughs> you didn't tell me that. Well, I'm telling you now. I'm an Arab, and I'm going to tell you something. As an Arab, those settlements on Jewish land are legal and legitimate and it is their right and then some to build on their land that God gave to them and not my people. Okay? All right. Syrian embassy aided Hezbollah prisoners escape. Oh, U.S. intelligence unsure over Muslim Brotherhood agenda. Abbas says no. Yeah, that's humorous, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> really? really? You know, I, I'd love... Never mind, I'm not going to get started. I'll... Abbas says no to elections if Gazans cannot vote. Egypt army says it won't field presidential candidate. Brotherhood role rising in Egypt. Iran denies cancellation warships to cross Suez Canal. Just this morning, Fox News, they uh, had the uh, former UN ambassador for Israel, Dan Gillerman, uh, very articulate, very uh, intelligent, very uh, well-spoken, and he's really got his finger on the pulse of what's going on. And basically what he's saying is, is that now absent uh, Mubarak in Egypt, uh, absent a peace agreement with Egypt, which really is all but ended. Uh, in present, the Islamic, you know, Muslim uh, Brotherhood, uh, you have now warships that are in the Suez Canal. If you look at a map, and I should have had a Google Earth here, but uh, the Suez Canal dumps out into the Mediterranean, goes up the coast of Israel, Haifa, uh, Tel Aviv, and then 
uh, up into Syria, and they're going to uh, go to Syria first time since 1979. Um, and of course, Egypt controls the Suez Canal. Now, what do you suppose they're going to do there with uh, Iranian warships uh, in Syria? Uh, can you say Isaiah 17? What's Isaiah 17? Well, verse 1 says that Damascus, Syria, will become a ruinous heap. I really believe, and I've long held to the belief, that Syria is really a proxy of Iran and that Israel will destroy with a preemptive strike Syria. And that's why they're not mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Bahrain tightens grip on protest. Israeli troops kill Gaza suspects. Uh, Friday, February 18th, defying the U.S., PA pushes for U.N. anti-settlement vote. Syria to EU, tackle Israel, not Egypt, for Middle East peace. Saudi Prince Talal warns, warns of uprising threat, reports anarchy in Sinai Peninsula. Then Saturday, yesterday, February 19th, Al-Qaeda number two issues video after Egypt upheaval. Peace treaty with, with Israel is up to the Egyptian people. No, it's not. And even if it were, they don't want a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, Libyan forces kill 84 anti-government protests in raids. Israeli settlements, and this is what we just talked about, U.S. vetoes UNSC resolution. Now again, on the outside that might sound like we're still supporting Israel, but the fact of the matter is, is that we still call the settlements illegitimate. Palestinians want day of rage against U.S., Muslim Brotherhood preacher insists Egypt's revolution has only just begun, and he is spot on. Here's the last one, and I think it says it all. I think this is from yesterday and again today. Ahmadinejad says, quote, the final move has begun. Revolution in Egypt managed by the 12th Imam. Who's the 12th Imam? Well, Joel Rosenberg has written an excellent book by the same title. I would encourage you to read it. The 12th Imam for Shiite Muslims is the coming Muslim Messiah. And the 12th Imam, or if you're a Sunni Muslim, you would call him the Mahdi. He will come at a time when there is chaos in the Middle East, especially with uh, respect to the Arab or the Islamic nations attacking Israel, wiping Israel off the map. Then he will come and he will rule for, are you ready for this? Seven years. And he will bring peace. Seven years. Does that, is that, can you, can I, need I say more? I believe that it has begun. This is the final move. And Egypt is behind the scenes being started, uh, and it will start the entire Middle East off on this path towards this coming Muslim Messiah. I would suggest to you that this is what Jesus was talking about. When he said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, I think these are the things that he was saying that we need to be watching for when they begin to come to pass. See, I believe that all that's happening in the Middle East points to the fulfillment of Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, Isaiah 19, and Ezekiel 38 and 39, amongst other prophecies and passages and probably in that order though I'm not dogmatic about it and the rapture of the church could happen either before at or though more possible than probable after these prophecies are fulfilled I still believe 
that we will not see prior to the rapture of Ezekiel 38 because we're told by the prophet Ezekiel that Israel will be dwelling in security, securely with unwalled villages. See, I think that's when the Antichrist signs the peace agreement and that's when they bring those walls down that they erected in the Intifada in 2000. Now again, no man knows the day or the hour of his coming for his bride, but we can know that his return draws nigh and is even at the door. I am keenly aware that there are those who would argue that there's no way any of us can be sure that he comes in our lifetime. I would beg to differ on the authority of God's word. Here's why. The scriptures are really quite clear, actually, that the generation that sees the rebirth of the nation Israel will be the generation that sees the return of Jesus Christ. May 14th, 1948, by one vote in the UN, Israel was re reborn as a nation. And then subsequently, in the Six-Day War, June 1967, they captured their eternal capital, Jerusalem. Now the question is, well, how long is a generation? Oh, there's many who have speculated. But again, we can't know the day or the hour, but we can know that we are that generation that is alive, witnessing the rebirth of the nation Israel. See, it seems to be that there's this unstoppable momentum with a short shelf life with all of these prophecies collectively. I don't know if you see pro Bible prophecy that way. It's not linear. It's not static. It's very fluid in the sense that when certain prophecies are beginning to come to pass, you set in motion prophetic events that develop a momentum, and it's an unstoppable momentum. And do you realize that some of the prophecies, like the one we just talked about, with the generation being alive for the return of Jesus Christ, the one that witnesses the rebirth of Israel, that prophecies like that, are they have a shelf life. They're time sensitive, if I can say it that way. The prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming were time sensitive. In other words, they could only be fulfilled at a specific and perfect time, and they were. So too, with the prophecies concerning the second coming, we see that there is a certain time-driven nature to them, and we see now this unstoppable momentum. It reminds me of what Jesus said in Revelation. He says, Behold, I come quickly. It's an interesting word in the original language of the New Testament. It's the Greek word tachos, where we get our word tachometer, which in our cars is a measurement of revolutions per minute, RPM. So what Jesus was saying was, I'm going to come at a time when things are speeding up, revved up. I come quickly. There's going to be this unstoppable momentum as things now begin to happen more quickly. It really coincides with the prophecies that Jesus uh, gave where he likened his return to a woman in birth pains and how that the birth pains come with greater intensity and shorter frequency. And we see now these things happening that way. Well, I want to close our prophecy update with John 14, 29. <coughs> Jesus said, And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Let me paraphrase this. Jesus is essentially saying, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, you will believe. Are you a believer here this morning? If you're not, I would really encourage you to revisit these prophecies that we've just looked at, especially with 
how things are heating up and revving up in the Middle East. And don't take my word for it. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures and see if what I have just shared with you is true. I believe that this is exactly what God is telling us. I told you this would happen before it happens. Now it's happening. You need to believe. You need to put your trust in me. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can have an opportunity to know him and have a personal saving relationship with him before you leave this church today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for Bible prophecy and I thank you for the urgency that it creates within our hearts, that expectancy that it creates within our hearts. Lord, I just pray that you'll take these things that we've just looked at and <coughs> give us understanding. Give us minds that can really grasp and assimilate these things and their meaning to us personally in our lives. And Lord, for anyone who does not know you that's in this church today, I pray that you'll so speak to their heart that they would open their heart and receive you. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.